one of the things that's fun about applied science is we get to troll mathematicians by taking things they're very proud of for having no practical use and putting them to practical use. I'm Professor Mark Enders, Applied Science Department at William & Mary. I'm here outside the Integrated Science Center and I'd like to talk to you about the curse of dimensionality. One of the trickiest parts about doing machine learning is deciding what features from your data you're going to use to do the classification. You can't just feed everything um, into your classifier. You have to decide what are the right parts of the data, the right things you extract from the data in order to best allow the classifier to um, give you the answers that you want. So I'm not big on deep learning. Um, deep learning has two issues for me. First one is that you um, don't have any feeling for what's happening inside of the black box. All right? And we like to work on problems where our understanding of the measurement or the physics or the phenomenon um, allows us to help guide the classifier. So we tend to do supervised learning sorts of things. The other issue I have with deep learning is that um, in many cases people don't have anywhere near enough training data. And if you don't have enough training data, uh, your system isn't learning, it's just memorizing your training data. And that's why you often find people who are doing deep learning naively is that they get pretty good results at first and then they try it on something just a little bit different and their results are as good as a coin flip. So back to curse of dimensionality. When you start deciding what features are going to extract from your data in order to do the classification, uh, what you find is you add a few and it works pretty good, you add a few more it works a bit better, and then at some point you add a few more features uh, to your classifier and the performance starts to fall off. Initially it gets better and then it gets worse. Uh, and this issue um, is a general phenomenon uh, and it's really disappointing to everybody who does machine learning and or what we used to call pattern classification. So, part of our research is trying to do feature selection or feature down selection intelligently. From all the features that you could extract from your data to do the machine learning, what are the right ones to optimally um, perform the classification function? Right. So let me give you a specific example that we've been working on. Um, uh, if you flush the toilet on an aircraft carrier, they don't dump that into the ocean. That would be bad manners. Instead, all over something like an aircraft carrier, and presumably cruise ships, um, are sewage tanks, and they're tucked around here and there, um, inaccessible, obviously. Um, and an important issue for a cruise ship or an aircraft carrier or some such thing is, uh, is one or more of my sewage tanks getting ready to spring a leak because it's corroding on the inside? And the standard way this is done is periodically the ship is brought into dock, dry dock, and somebody who's um, low in the totem pole and small enough to fit goes inside there and does maybe an ultrasonic thickness measurement um, to look for corrosion uh, so that things can be repaired uh, before uh, it springs a leak, which is a mess. Uh, and so we've been developing a technique called ultrasonic guided waves, LAM waves they're called, and these have the advantage that they propagate long distances in plates, pipes, and shells. They will follow the curvature uh, of things and you can propagate them from one place to another place and they have the property that how fast they go depends upon the thickness of the metal that they're in. And so if you have a place where it's corroded a little bit that will cause the lamb waves traveling through the corrosion uh, to either speed up or slow down. So this has been well known for a long time um, and so this could allow you to inspect something like the sewage tank on an aircraft carrier which we all can agree is an important practical problem. Uh, the, uh, uh, the problem is that when the corrosion gets severe enough, the thickness change gets severe enough, uh, the lamb waves won't just speed up or slow down, they will interact with that corrosion quite in a complicated way. They will scatter and diffract and, and so on. They also, the lamb waves come in in lots of different modes, the energy will shift from one mode to another. So you've got this mode conversion, you've got scattering, you've got the speeding up and slowing down. Uh, it's delightfully complicated from, from our perspective. So, we've also developed a technique called lamb wave tomography, which allows us to take a bunch of crisscross measurements um, and then reconstruct tomographically a CT scan, if you want, of the thickness by mapping out the slowness and then the dispersion curves relate that to um, the velocity of the modes that we're tracking. 
And this works fine if the corrosion isn't too severe, but as soon as um, uh, the predominant effects is scattering, all of a sudden the tomographic maps, although they'll show where the corrosion is, uh, they won't be quantitative and show how severe the corrosion is. Okay? And so, we do a tomographic reconstruction, and that tells us where the corrosion is, and then the geometry of the problem tells us which rays um, uh, travel through the corrosion, and we know that there's something in that waveform that we've recorded of the uh, land waves going through the corrosion in different directions that carries the information about the scattering. And that those waveforms that travel through the corrosion, that's the thing that we do the um, machine learning on. So now the question is what features are we going to extract from those waveforms to use for the machine learning, for the pattern classification. What we want to do is classify the extent of corrosion from maybe 0 to 10, um, where 0 is 100% is thickness and 10 is a hole that has sprung a leak. And you really want to know where are we along um, from um, fully intact to springing a leak so that we can plan uh, the maintenance. Okay. So the very signal processing techniques that we've developed allows us to extract a variety of features from uh, the waveforms uh, that might be useful for classification. Let's say we pick some number of them like 80 and we want to classify in 10 different um, uh, categories of depth of corrosion, thickness loss. 80 is too many, way too many. If you plot the curse of dimensionality, if you plot them, the reconstruction of the thickness as um, uh, versus the number of, of uh, features you're using, you will find, of course, that initially it improves and it falls off. And you really need to decide what, let's say, a dozen, maybe 15 features you're going to use. And it's not at all obvious which ones and which combinations of them are going to be the right ones to use for this problem. So, um, we're going to use some common sense because it's a practical problem. If your um, feature space uh, has the different classes sort of spread out on a line, that's probably a good one because then if you misclassify a 6 as a 7, uh, that's not so bad of a difference. And oh, by the way, um, the classes are always going to overlap. Those are the kind of problems that are interesting to work on. So um, if we plot things in a feature space, show two dimensions, but it's n-dimensional feature space, that things are, the, the different um, classes are um, uh, spread out on a line, um, a hyperline, uh, that's good. But if they sort of loop back on themselves, that's bad because um, now instead of a 6 versus a 7, you might call it a 3 rather than a 7, um, and that's going to be an issue. So in um, in abstract higher dimensional feature space, we can look at the, the feature vector and see um, how they're related to each other. They're going to overlap, that's just the way it is, but are they spread out in a line, uh, sort of sequentially, or is it a loopy thing? And we can write some um, uh, uh, metrics about um, how well separated they are, um, how straight that line is, um, tortuosity is a, is a well-defined um, metric that tells you how not straight um, a line is. So those sorts of things um, work pretty well. The other thing that we found worked pretty well, and Corey Miller, the graduate student who was working on this, he had once taken a class in computational homology, and that's one of those things that apparently has no practical value. And he's like, I think this will work. There's a thing called a Betty number. And the Betty number um, talks about um, how connected things are. And so if we look at the feature vector space, um, the Betty number can talk about how much the different kinds of the different classes overlap each other. And of course, we want ones that don't overlap very much. And so calculating this very abstract quantity called the Betty number um, in our feature space that allows us to uh, intelligently down select from, say, 80 potential um, uh, features to the right number, which might be something like uh, 10 or 15. So it's, it's fairly um, abstract mathematically. Of course, I'll put links to the papers um, on the webpage. Um, you can read those. Um, feel free to email me or maybe Corey with specific questions about that. It works surprisingly well. Practical problem, abstract mathematics, uh, a clever way to solve uh, the machine learning problem of intelligently down-selecting feature vectors. I'm Professor Mark Hinders, Applied Science Department at William & Mary, as.wm.edu. 
feel free to drop me an email. I'd be happy to tell you more about this and other projects we're working on in the lab.